This video was made to fundraise for the Emergency Charity Organization, which has for 30 years helped victims of war, landmines, and party all over the world. If you wish to donate, do so with the Feltify link in the description. But donating, you will receive an exclusive piece of art with everyone's signatures and doodle of the characters they chose for this video. With that being said, let's get right into the video. Hello everyone, it's me, Savvy. I love Kirby. One of the first games I've ever played was Kirby's Return to Dreamland, and it definitely left an impression on me. The multiplayer, the levels, and the bosses captured my heart like no other game before did. Fast forward to a few years later when I obtained Kirby Triple Deluxe and it changed the way I viewed video games. I love the story, the gimmick, the music, and I have this very vivid memory of me and my sibling being in a mall parking lot after purchasing the game and me wondering about all the crazy stuff you could do with it just by looking at the back of the box. Years later, my love for Kirby reawakened thanks to content creation and to the people I met while creating entertainment for others. Kirby as a series and a character really shaped who I became, as the funny little puffball not only taught me the values of friendship, but of redemption, change, growth, sadness, company, and also coming face to face with the reality that you can't always trust anyone. Although a little bit naive at times, Kirby can be a total badass, and at the same time can show vulnerability. The Kirby series is a celebration of humanity, showing diversity in characters and backstories, showing how much power can come when working together and being nice and helpful to others, showing that in a world of negativity and darkness, we can all be a Kirby. So thank you Kirby, thank you Hall, and thank you to this wonderful community. But what would Kirby be without their allies? So I decided to invite my allies, whether it be found family, friends, or people that I approached for this very video to talk about their favorite characters and why they love them so much. Take it away, fellas. Every Kirby fan knows the tale of his highness. A once bringer of peace who lost his way after self-proclaiming himself as king of dreamland, gone tyrannical due to sheer ego and greed, who got knocked down a peg a couple of times and slowly but surely began to show more and more interest to act like a true king and to be the one to keep the peace while still holding on to a petty grudge of not being the strongest in the land, thanks to a kid that showed up out of nowhere. While DDD can be seen as a joke due to how he keeps losing to a literal child and doesn't seem to handle it well, to me, King DDD might just be one of the best Kirby characters, and therefore, one of my favorites. He is a character that from the very beginning was displayed to be somewhat insecure of his might, even if at the time it was through the character of a self-centered and entitled villain. But as he begins to grow and to understand that there are people better than him, he begins to ground himself back to reality, and to act like a true king. King Dedede wholly encompasses a story taught in almost every modern Kirby game, the idea of redemption, and that no matter how horrible of a person you might be, if you know what you did wrong, know what's right, and are truly sorry for your wrongdoings, you can change and become a better person. While the world might not forgive, for it won't forget, you can still try to clean up your image. While the world might assume the worst from you, that shouldn't be an excuse for you to stop trying to improve. And while it sometimes might be hard to accept that you can't always be the very best version of yourself, you can walk it off and remember that there will always be loyal people by your side. King Dedede reminds me of what it's like to be human. <laughs> Ironic, coming from a penguin-like creature. He reminds me of what it's like to fail, to lose your way, and to better yourself after making regrettable mistakes, after not communicating, and after holding on to grudges. Of what it's like to make amends, friends, family, and to try to reconnect with a part of you that drew loss from yourself. Of what it's like to be strong, weak, jealous, upset, stubborn, just plain sad and disappointed on yourself. But also to love yourself and those who are loyal to you. To always be there for the other, even if you don't initially want to take part of any of it. I am like King Dedede. And I think we all are. This is why I absolutely loved His Majesty. Thanks to an over 30 year old, ever evolving story, he might not just be one of my favorite Kirby characters, but 
one of the best characters in the whole franchise. Because thanks to him learning from his mistakes and striving to be better, King Dedede will always be perfect. I also want to add that King Dedede is a strong, heroic, and confident character who just so happens to have a bigger body type, and as someone who has for a large portion of my life have been a bit bigger than my peers, having a character with a big gut like King Dedede meant a lot for my self-confidence about my body. And that's another reason as to why King Dedede means a lot to me. I, I, I just didn't know how to fit this little detail about him and my relationship with this character in the whole personality speech I did, so uh, I'm, I'm adding this now. And that's all I have to say about King Dedede. Bye! Oh, Meta Knight, what a character. There is so much to be said, and at the same time, there's little that hasn't been said. Despite starring in Kiri's adventure, I didn't get to meet this character until the Wii days with Kiri's Epic Yarn, Return Dreamland, and most importantly, Super Smash Bros. Brawl. And if you know that game, you know that's Meta Knight Central over there. Meta Knight is always a highlight for me whenever he appears in a game. He marks a level of presence no other character does. Even if he's just standing there menacingly, he has such an aura of look at me, I'm him. And every single one of his fights are like a beautiful dance, as Meta Knight is one of the few boss that reacts to your movements in believable ways. You're not just fighting a boss, you're fighting a trained swordsman. And that's not even touching all his amazing themes. His original Superstar team versus Meta Knight feels dangerous and precise, like every second could be your last. And some of his new ones, mainly in Sword of the Surviving Guardian, it's such a rush of energy as he skyrockets one of the most dynamic fights in the game to a legendary clash of titles. And don't get me started on my friend and the setting song, a masterclass in using a musical motif to showcase progression to the series. But talking about his personality, at first, I just saw him as this cool guy, and while that still stands as one of the most defining characteristics, after going back and forth between all pieces of Kirby media, I found this knight with a heart of gold. A knight that is willing to protect his people and to train itself for the worst outcomes. And I also saw a story of a conflicted and lonesome knight, someone whose motivations are a secret to everyone. They might seem evil or heroic, but to Meta Knight, it doesn't matter what route he takes to do what he thinks is right. And yet, he has learned to trust others, to train the next generation of warriors, and to assist them when needed. While Meta Knight might not always be in the front lines, he will always be my favorite character in the series, the lonely swordsman, ready to protect his home and the people he cares about, no matter the cost. That's Meta Knight. And so he's like really cool, so like so, so like he's really cool, so like yeah, so like so like so like yeah, so like so like Hello everybody, Claire Fluffle here and happy new year! And what better way to talk about the new year than to talk about the newest, greatest character who's been around since 2008 or 1996, depending on who you ask. It's Bandana D! There are so many reasons to love Bandana D. I actually have an entire video on my own channel about how I appreciate Bandana D from a speedrunning aspect. But since I'm here, thanks to the ever epic Savvy the Gamer, I'll actually focus on the character side for once. If there is one word that I would use to describe Bandana D, it would be faithful. What I love about Bandana D is how faithful he is to really everybody around him. Obviously, as a Waddle Dee, he looks up to and idolizes day to day, as we can see in games like Battle Royale, Return to Dreamland, the works. But even Kirby standing by their side as a true friend throughout the very same game, we see Bandana D really look up to Day to Day in and Battle Royale, but also help Alan in adventures like Rainbow Curse, Forgotten Land, Triple Deluxe, Planet Robobot, th the works. If there is one Kirby character that I would trust top to bottom, it absolutely would be Bandana D. Not to say that there's anything wrong with other Kirby characters, but Bandana D for sure is just the one that I find the most genuine. I feel like if any Kirby character would feel bad for hurting my feelings, for example, Bandana D would also be the first one to make up for doing that. Of course, I also need to comment how much I enjoy playing as Bandana D. Rainbow Curse is actually super fun playing as Bandana D if you don't do anything with Kirby and just try to play it as a regular Kirby game, but use the ink to help Bandana D get across. It's a very different experience and one that I think actively makes Rainbow Curse more fun. Not that I dislike Rainbow Curse, but 
Bandana D and the Rainbow Curse is actually more epic. Then, of course, there are silly things that you can do with Bandana D in games such as Return to Dreamland, Forgotten Land, all that good stuff. I thoroughly enjoy the Bandana D exclusive dive attack that he got in Star Allies, and while it technically returned in Forgotten Land, it more importantly returned in Return to Dreamland Deluxe without Kirby getting it, signifying that this is something that only Bandana D gets, thus giving him more of an identity compared to Kirby, and I really appreciate that. To make a semi-long story short, I love Bandanity because he's trustworthy, he's a great friend, and he's a lot of fun to play as. All of these can also apply to Ike from the Fire Emblem games, specifically Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. I love Ike a lot because- Ah, Kirby spin-offs. In my opinion, they're just as iconic as the main games themselves. You can't deny that a lot of Kirby's library is just spin-offs, and honestly, I kinda like that. It means that there's a game for everyone, from platforming, to fighting, to puzzles, to frickin' golf, of all things. Hell, my first ever Kirby game was a spin-off, that being Kirby's Dream Course. N not the best start, but hey, everyone starts somewhere. Jokes aside, I hold the same amount of respect for the spin-off games as much as I do the main games. Dream Buffet being my favorite spin-off, actually. The combination of racing and a Mario Party-like minigame, uh, Battle Royale, makes for an incredibly fun and unique experience. And you may be wondering why I'm talking about all these spin-offs. Well, let me tell you something. I don't think Kirby should be the main mascot of these spin-offs. I think there's someone far more fitting and deserving of that title. That would be Kiwi. Kiwi, he's an interesting fellow. He appears mainly in Kirby spin-offs and sub-games, like Kirby's Dream Course, Kirby's Dream Buffet, and I guess if you want to count the sub-games, even though it might not be Kiwi, yeah, he shows up there too. Kiwi is essentially just a carbon copy of Kirby, but yellow. But despite that, he does actually show an inch of personality in, in the games he appears in. For example, in Kirby's Dream Course, Kiwi is peacefully sleeping, just in the middle of nowhere, as one does, and Kirby like, the very good person he is decides to, uh, hit him as a fireball. Kibi, understandably upset, just decides to, uh, needle him. Yeah, he just turns into a bunch of needles and falls right down on him. This is the only time this happens. In other cutscenes, you can see Kibi being exceptionally aggressive towards Kirby, and even in other games it's been on, so you can kind of see it. Another example is Kibi in the key art for Kirby Fighters 2, he's the one wielding the wrestler copy ability, which is far more violent than any other copy ability in the game, in my personal opinion. I like how, even without dialogue, the games are able to portray Kibi just in a way that's completely different from Kirby, despite his appearance. Now, am I looking too deeply into this? Yeah, probably. But it's still fun to think about Kibi having a different personality from Kirby, despite being just a, a simple color swap physically. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if Kibi is someone's favorite Kirby character. He does have enough personality to stand on his own, and I think it'd be interesting if he did manage to show up in a main game someday. Eh, one can wish. One can wish. Hi, I'm Sky, and I'm going to be talking about the animal friends. And what better way to start off than talking about the main three? Wreck the hamster, kind the fish, and coo the owl. Huh? Hold the phone, folks. I'm getting important news flash from Hal. The animal friends aren't animals? Wreck, kind, and coo only resemble their likenesses? The original Japanese text says Wreck, kind, and coo who look like a hamster, a fish, and an owl, respectively? Well, there goes that script. Rick, Kine, and Koo first debuted in Kirby's Dreamland 2, mainly to help Kirby collect the rainbow drops in the Rainbow Islands to stop dark matter. Each of them can be found after beating a mini-boss, and they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Rick is actually the first buddy you'll meet when playing, and is very versatile on land. He can run slightly faster than Kirby, can't slip on ice, and can even wall jump in Dreamland 3. Kine, on the other hand, is very slow on land. His way of walking is actually just short hopping, but he's very speedy in the water and can even bypass strong currents, making those water levels bearable. Koo is the fastest of the three. If you ever want to speedrun Dreamland 2, you gotta have him. Even in the water, he's still pretty speedy. Not to mention he's even faster in Dreamland 3. All three of them enhance Kirby's copy abilities, being burning, cutter, ice, needle, parasol, spark, and stone. Now onto Dreamland 3 with Naga the Cat, Choo Choo the Octopus, and Pitch the... 
warbling white eye. Or we can just go with bird. Them, and including the previous three, all help Kirby collect the heart stars to stop dark matter taking over Dreamland. Naga, like his counterpart Rick, is the first buddy we meet on this adventure, but unlike the previous game, he doesn't need to be rescued from a mini-boss. Actually, all of them don't, thankfully. He can be found in a room with Rick in the first stage, letting the player pick between the two. But the friend not getting picked would get sad, angry, or shocked, which is a really cute detail in my opinion. Naga can do both a double and triple jump in the air, making it easier to leap around, and can stop on enemies too. Chuju can extend her tentacles to grab nearby enemies and stuff them into Kirby or Gooey's mouth. She can also stick and move along ceilings, making it easy to avoid enemies or falling platforms. But unlike her counterpart kind, she isn't fast in the water. Pitch is slightly similar to Koo, being able to carry Kirby in the air, but not fast in the air nor can go through wind currents, but is fast when carrying Kirby on those toothpick legs he's got when dashing, and can go through gaps of a single block's height thanks to being the smallest out of everyone else. Like the previous game, they all enhance Kirby's copy abilities and even include a new ability, Clean, which would reappear in Star Allies. Overall, the Animal Friends are such a cool group of characters, even being connected to one of the biggest recurring baddies in the entire series, that being Dark Matter, of course. They're also one of the oldest friends Kirby's had in the series too, having multiple appearances in other games, references to them, and novels. Heck, they even show up in promotional material for the Kirby Cafe. Not even Magla or showed up in artwork yet. Not a brag, but I even own a Rick plush from the Poo 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 Friends series. I wish Nago, Chuju, and Pitch got the same love like Rick and Koo did, but at least they finally got some plushies. Hopefully, we'll see them all again in a future Kirby game, or maybe even some new animal friends. Hello everyone, Pegachow here, and as you may or may not know, I absolutely love the Dark Matter trilogy. Asterisk. Dream 1 2 aside, the other two games in the trilogy are my two personal favorite Kirby games for all sorts of things like their charming atmosphere, ability experimentation, remarkable stages and bosses. I could just go on and on. Um, and I do in my Dark Matter Trilogy retrospective series I'm currently working on wrapping up. Yeah, I'm shameless. Do finish watching this first though. But anyways, I'm here to talk about the characters that really tie the whole Dark Matter Trilogy together. And it's none other than the Dark Matter. And I'll be looking at the entire species from the basic Dark Matter all the way up to the leaders like Zero and Zero Two to see what makes these seemingly simple villains Kirby's best antagonists. We're better to start them with the actual designs of the Dark Matter, and I think they are consistently great across the board. Some of my favorite designs in the series also come from this group like Dark Matter Blade or Zero Two. The Dark Matter all share this common design motif of using eyeballs in the design, and not only is it just incredibly cool and iconic, but it helps them feel so off-putting and alien, which works so well because the Dark Matter are essentially the thing that introduced darker and more abstract elements into the series. It's most apparent in DL3 and 64 and basically defines those games' atmosphere. It's like it's Shimamura's directing style. And that same sort of strange quirkiness that emanates from these games emanates into the Dark Matter. So why exactly do I consider the Dark Matter to be perfect villains? Well, we could kind of split that up into two different main sections. One of them is a little more focused on the lore and backstory of the series, while the other one is more about the events that unfold during the Dark Matter trilogy. I'm sure we've all heard about the Void reincarnation into Kirby and Dark Matter thing. I'm not going over the whole thing here, I don't have whole day. But basically, it's heavily implied in lore that Kirby and Dark Matter both come from Void Termina, and it's what gives their clashes these personal stakes. Besides, Kirby's the embodiment of everything positive, while Dark Matter and Zero embodies everything negative. It's this clash of ideals and connection to our main hero that sets the Dark Matter up to be perfect villains. But how are they executed? Dream 1 2 doesn't do too bad for a Game Boy game. The story is simple, with the Dark Matter just coming down to steal the Rainbow Bridges from the Rainbow Islands and Popstar, and Kirby just comes and kicks their ass, and that's pretty much it. But it does set the stage for the later games, and it's a prelude for things to come, because in Dream Land 3, there's a full-on Dark Matter invasion as Popstar is fully shrouded in Dark Matter, and Kirby and friends set off to stop it. Not much really happens up until the game's climax, though, where it's revealed inside the Hyper Zone that Zero is the one pulling the strings the whole time and is the leader of the Dark Matter, and he's like the complete antithesis to Kirby. Kirby defeats Zero using the Love Love Stick, though, and while it seems like the Dark Matter threat is taken care of for good, in Kirby 64, the Dark Matter are back and have decided to set their sights on a different planet with similar levels of positivity and joy, but no Guardian to defend it. Rumi just barely manages to escape from the Dark Matter, and she prompts Kirby and friends to set out across the galaxy to save Ripple Star, which we even get to see fully corrupted. Not only that, but we also get to see the Dark Matter's home planet of Dark Star. This is also where Kirby and Zero Two have their confrontation, with Zero Two essentially being a revived form of Zero, which just makes the stakes even more personal here. And ultimately, this fight is just so perfect. It's climactic, it's atmospheric, it ends the Dark Matter trilogy's grand and epic story on such a good note, and it cements the Dark Matter as the best in Kirby's rogues gallery. Also, I didn't mention him here, but Gooey rocks. I uh, just figured I'd mention that. We love Gooey in this house.
You know who doesn't get enough appreciation in Kirby? The little guys. Okay, too small, but you got the right idea. Enemies and helpers have a lot on their plates, from being the population of Kirby's world to having designs that just scream, Hey, I give a copy ability! There's something intuitive about all their designs that just make you go, I want to swallow that. Once you've copied the ability from one enemy, their unique designs help remind the player what ability they give for the next time you run into them. One of my absolute favorite helpers is Knuckle Joe. I mean, first of all, that's just an objectively good name. <laughs> Knuckle Joe. Sounds like he's the main character in his own fighting game. Something I really like about these older games is that they had to make designs that would look good and readable as sprites. You know, stuff like Mario's mustache or Sonic's tan arms. Knuckle Joe just looks really good in his sprite form, better than most of the other helpers in my opinion. In his art, we can see that he's wearing some nice blue shoes and a nice blue... shirt? Or maybe that's just his body. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. But when you look at it in the game, it looks more like a blue jumpsuit, which still fits really well for him. It makes those white boxing gloves stand out, and that helps in showing what he does, which, as his name implies, is Punch. And Kick 2, but I'm guessing the name Metatarsophalangeal Joint Joe is taken. Then there's that iconic golden hair, which perfectly complements his blue attire. Not only does that spiky look give him a bit of that rowdy edge, but it just looks cool. I mean, it's got that eat me component to it I mentioned earlier. Even when it isn't gold, it's still striking. Like, come on, everyone who's seen Knuckle Joe while playing a Kirby game has thought, yo, let's put that guy in my mouth. And if you haven't, you're a liar. Oh, we also can't forget some of the smaller details, like his shoulder armor, or his spiky ears, or that cool jock strap he's wearing on his head. He's really setting a fashion trend with that last one, let me tell you. Oh, oops, uh, we're going a little overtime here. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. Hope I made you appreciate Knuckle Joe just a little bit more. Hello everybody, I am that subnautic protagonist, and today I'm here to tell you all a little bit about one of my favorite villains in the Kirby franchise, that being Marx from Kirby Superstar. Kirby Superstar is an accumulation of a bunch of smaller games that all kind of wrap into one nicely knit package that you could purchase at your local GameStop back in the day. Mark doesn't make his appearance until the final chapter of the game, Milky Way Wishes, in which he tells Kirby that the Sun and Moon are currently having a fight, and it's up to Kirby to go into space to find a wish-granting magical cat clockwork star that can grant a wish that will prevent them from fighting any longer. Bit of a strange story, but I would say that given the Kirby franchise, this feels on par. So Kirby goes out into space and collects all the pieces to summon the Nova. Once he does so, however, Mark swoops in and steals the wish for himself, wishing to grow big arms and take over the world. Real bad do this Mark's guy. He literally backstabbed us without having any arms and then grew some more. I think Marx as a character is a, a pretty interesting part in the Kirby franchise because I think he's definitely the most complex that the entire series got until this point. Uh, and I think that he really did influence a lot of future decisions when it came to modern Kirby. When it comes to Kirby Superstar Ultra, the remake in which he makes his reappearance, uh, that is the first game that has pause screen um, explanations for backstory. And I think that in general, his type of writing uh, influenced a lot of modern Kirby with characters like uh, Magalor, Taranza, Susie, so on and so forth. Marx really is one of the best villains in the franchise because he has this kind of venom to him, this kind of manipulative planning kind of edge to him that, um, you know, makes him a lot more hateable than a lot of the other uh, villains in the franchise who are just evil for the sake of being evil. I think it's beautiful to come to hate your villains on a very personal level, and I think Marx really accomplishes that. Especially when it comes to characters that are really iconic to the Curry franchise, I think Marx really does take the cake for the villains. Uh, because for one, he keeps being brought back for several different reasons, and for another, he is the only uh, Kirby boss to be put into Smash Bros, so I do think there is a plus for him there. He's extremely iconic with his kind of jester getup. I think he inspired a lot of other jester-related villains in other games going forward, uh, and I, I think he just, he's just a really swell, unlikable dude. He really just he really sucks, but I love him. He's just a big ball of legs. Uh, and for that reason, uh, yeah, Marx is one of my favorites, and I th th thank you for your time, for listening to me, and uh, 
Have a good one, everybody. Hi, I'm Nim, aka Aphid Kirby. My favorite Kirby character is Gooey. This Bobby Goofball means a lot to me. This character's inclusion is really something special. First introduced in Kirby's Element 2, gameplay-wise, he was merely a bonus encounter that rewarded you with goodies if you rescue an animal friend while already having an animal friend. In the back, where you'd normally find Rick, Kine, or Koo, now lies a little smiling blob. The game manual was very clear in stating that this is a kind of dark matter, just like the big bad villain of this very game. The same game that introduced dark matter as this evil, all-consuming force that wants nothing but darkness and nothingness, also introduced a member of their species that wants absolutely nothing to do with that. He just happened to be here. Already a very nuanced introduction to the world building of the Kirby universe. In this game, he had no role beyond this appearance, but already left a lot to wonder about. What makes him different? Who put him in that bag and why? This captured the minds of many and the fans have filled in blanks with their hopes. I personally adore the idea that it was Dark Matter Sourceman who put him in that bag after being ordered to dispose of this defective Dark Matter, but couldn't bear to actually kill him and just hit him away. There's actually a really cool comic, I'll link it in the description. Then Kirby's Dream Land 3 came out and wow, Gooey has a starring role as a fully playable character. The only other playable character after Kirby, in fact. Second in command. Dark Matter has once again arrived in Popstar, this time in a more massive way, even bringing in Zero, the apparent leader and source of the Dark Matters. And Gooey wants to help? Literally fighting against his own kind. It seems Gooey grew really attached to Kirby and the animal friends and probably the whole of Popstar after the events of Kirby's Dreamland 2. He's learned to love life here and he's willing to fight his family in order to protect it. A really sweet development for the idea of Gooey being a Dark Matter who doesn't let where he comes from define him. An individual that was shunned from his home for being different, finding a new family in people that love him just as he is, and turning on his own in order to protect those that actually love him. Gooey can be seen as a metaphor that a lot of people can gra gravitate towards. To anyone out there whose only crime was being born weirdly, whose family shunned them for not meeting their expectations, to anyone who feels like they're just a nuisance in their home, seeing Gooey and hoping that, for them, maybe there's also people somewhere that will find them and take them in and love them just like they are. And there are! I'm autistic, and growing up, I really felt shown away and put in a bag by my family for being different, even though I wasn't harming anyone. It was hard to love myself at first, but eventually, I ran into kindness. I found people that love me as I am, and helped me love myself, and fight against those that shame others just for being weird. If it isn't hurting anyone, just let people be themselves. Our minds come in so many different variations, and it's very fulfilling to embrace that. When people see me loving myself without hiding my weirdness, they also feel more comfortable to show themselves and their strange quirks. So you end up with a community that is very genuine, to themselves and each other. This happened to me when I first met Gui. Seeing him loving life, having no shame in being who he is, even if he was shunned for it by his own kind. He really inspired me. Um, so yeah, that's why Gooey is my favorite Kirby character. I think about him a lot. I even made a little short film using Kirby's Return to Dreamland mods where Gooey is the main character, and he teaches Dark Matter Sourceman to love life. Needless to say, Gooey is very special to me. Howdy, I'm Pigeon from Palm Tree Pigeon, and when I'm not playing Pizza Tower, I'm playing Kirby Superstar Stacker featuring a character named Grill. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Grill is the final boss of Kirby Superstar Stacker after you beat every single opponent without losing one, so basically a secret final boss to the game. Outside of being the final boss of her respective game, this is literally her only appearance outside of a couple cameos. Personally, I really like Grill's design. It's really unique to the Kirby series, and it's it's a, it's a fun design, you know? Granted, she really isn't my favorite character in the entire Kirby series. She is a really good contender at being one of my favorites at the very least. Now, as for the game she appears in, Kirby Superstar Stacker, that released in 1998 for the Super Famicom, and personally, I actually really love the game. I haven't played it for too long, but it's really fun. Probably because I really like a lot of puzzle games, to be honest, and it, I just dig it, you know? I, I dig the whole puzzle game thingy my bob. Not to mention, the game can get pretty difficult at times. I'd say that even getting to Grill, where, like I said before, you have to beat all the story mode stages without losing once, can be a difficult task at times, but overall it's still a fun game to play when you got some time to kill. 
Also, I think it's really cool that the Mask Dedede theme from Superstar Ultra takes some inspiration from the King Dedede theme in this game. It's a nice touch to me, I just really like that. Other than that, I'm a big fan of Girl's design in this game. I like her little witch hat a lot, and I just think her design overall is really cool. But in my opinion, I wish they'd use her more than just cameos. Maybe even some new artwork could be cool to see. But I don't know, I just think she's neat overall, and I wish they'd use her more in games. Who knows? Uh, maybe in the future we could see her again, because she has a lot of potential to hopefully be fleshed out more as a character in my opinion. For now, I guess I'll take what I can get. She's still cool in my opinion, but there's so little content of her, I'd just love to see this little creature come back in the future games, you know? Hey guys, it's Silvery. Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards has always been a very personal, nostalgic game to me. And I could go on and on about why, but most of what I love about this game is reflected in its unique characters, Adeline and Ribbon. Ribbon is the catalyst of the adventure, a young, brave fairy who valiantly falls trying to protect her homeworld. When things look absolutely bleak for the state of Ripplestar, she stays determined and doesn't waver in her quest. Thanks in part to the kindness she's shown and the friendship she forms with Kirby and the others. Like Kirby, she's simple but well-defined and incredibly endearing, and she plays an active role throughout the story and especially the final battle in such cool and memorable ways. If Ribbon reflects Kirby 64's story and themes, then Adeline reflects Kirby 64's creativity. I mean, she is a painter after all. Adeline is such a fascinating character to me. Personality-wise, she's not much different from Ribbon, being a kind, plucky heroine, she's a supportive member to the team, painting food to keep everyone's spirits high, and her possessed boss fight always stood out to me as the most interesting. But what really fascinates me about Adeline is simply her appearance in the Kirby series as a resident on Planet Popstar. She's human, or at least resembles one, and there's no one else like her in the series. Then, when you consider things like Shiverstar seemingly being a post-apocalyptic Earth, it turns this simple character into one rife with speculation, theory, and headcanon potential, bringing out the most of our imaginations as we try to rationalize her existence in this fantastical world. Adeline's character stimulates our creative thinking, which I think is incredibly fitting for an artist. I have so much love for Kirby 64, and these two are so synonymous with that game that of course that love extends to them as well. You can imagine my excitement when they returned in Kirby Star Allies, and I'm glad it seems like they're sticking around after such an extended absence. Here's hoping we see them join a main adventure again. Hi, Ronimator here, thanks for having me, Savvy. So, Escargoon, our favorite lovable snail guy man. <laughs> now the funny thing is, even though I'm talking about how great of a character Escargoon is right now, when I was younger, I really didn't like Escargoon. I think a lot of people agree here that as children, we see characters as plain good and plain bad. Now, Escargoon was the jerk type of character that helped Dedede and bullied Kirby on numerous occasions, which was enough to make me not like him as a kid. But when you grow older, you realize Escargoon, he's the best. As a child, you probably don't understand his funny jabs at DDD and how many jokes he makes. Well, maybe you did. Maybe I was just dumb as a child, but anyways, when you get older, you realize that his Escargoon's jokes are actually really funny and a part of his character. Even though he's a bully, he also provides comedy in most of the situations involving DDD. Not to mention his snarky personality. If anybody has played Undertale, then you know Escargoon is like the burger pants of Kirby. Both of them have terrible bosses who insult them, they're pretty sarcastic, and they're just hilarious in general, not to mention both being really popular in their own fandoms. Now my relationship with Kirby right back at ya. Kirby right back at ya, being Kirby's first time on TV, was pretty well done with all things considered. The characters were cute and they all had their great personalities, and I've already mentioned how good of a character Escargoon is. However, there is one character. One character that makes me want to rant for hours. Tiff. Tiff 
is the I'm always right kind of character. And don't get me wrong, these characters can be done well if they actually developed as a character. Like I said, I love Kirby right back at ya. I was so surprised when I realized Kirby had an anime, and I watched almost every episode. But soon it becomes the same thing with Tiff. DDD plots something, Tiff tells everybody DDD is plotting something, Monster attacks Kirby, Tiff is all, I told you so, and then calls the Warp Star, and Kirby destroys the monster. Now, if I were to change this up a bit, I would make it so other characters have some time in the spotlight. Don't make Tiff the only smart character, maybe have Tuff figure out something, or have the animal friends do it, or even have Lolo and Lalala La La have their own episodes time to time. This would make it so that Tiff isn't the only smart character, and that other characters have their time in the spotlight. Now, about the animal friends, as I mentioned. Normally, I would talk about how they deserve a bigger role in the anime, aside from t the new characters, Tiff and Tuff. But, since this, ep this show was based on Kirby's adventure, I can't really complain. Overall, Kirby's Right Back Gacha is pretty good, even if there were some things that would change about it. And, anyways, as I mentioned, S Targoon is in the show, so you know what? S tier! Yo! Amazing Mirror! Amazing Mirror. I love Amazing Mirror, man. I can't get enough of that game. Love that game. So the first time I played Amazing Mirror, it was on an emulator. I think it was during class. Yeah, it was. I was one of those kids. So I think I was playing it on a, a website. I remember playing it for the first time, maybe when I was 11 years old. And it was pretty fun, actually. I liked it. I enjoyed my time with the game. Although, after the open world started, I almost instantly got lost. And I spent, like, maybe an hour, two hours trying to figure out where to go. And I, I just ended up looking it up. And apparently, you had to destroy some specific blocks with a specific ability to progress through the game. And that's that's that's, that's good game design. That is really, really good game design right there. Man, I love, love that. That is good game design. But all jokes aside, I, I, I think it's a pretty good game. I know it's not that popular in the community, really. I know a lot of people kind of seem to hate it nowadays, but I think it's fine. I think it's... I never actually get to, got to play the multiplayer. I just played it by myself, but I thought it was alright. Uh, the characters. Characters, alright. So, uh, Shadow Kirby, Dark Midnight. I'm actually a pretty big Dark Midnight fan, to be honest. I do know a lot of people dislike Dark Midnight because uh, he got into Star Allies over Shadow Kirby, which is kind of fair, actually. I, I kind of agree, in a way. But that, that kind of makes me like him even more, because, you know, he's such an unpopular character. Like, who who actually cares about Dark Midnight? Like, for real, like, who actually likes this guy? Nobody does, and that, you know, makes me, like, you know, like him even more. Because, you know, liking unpopular things is cool, and liking popular things is not cool. And, I mean, the concept for his character is just, like, you know, it's awesome. Like, Im imagine you take Meta Knight, and you make him even cooler. How is that even possible? It's not possible. It's not, but they did it anyways. That's why he's such a cool, epic, awesome character, man. I love that guy. I love Dark Man and Light. And Shadow Kirby. Shadow Kirby's kind of cool. He's a pretty good concept, I guess. I feel like you could do a lot with him. They just don't. I don't really care for what they do with him in the Fighters games. But, you know, I, I'm glad that he's actually being used, at least. Yeah. He, he has potential. They, they just need to, you know, actually use him more often. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. My pick for the Kirby series' best character is Drasha. Featured in the DS game Kirby Canvas Curse, released in 2005 as the main antagonist, Drasha was one of several anonymous paintings created in a now-deserted art studio located in Floralia by an unknown artist with a miraculous paintbrush. After countless years, Drasha would slowly gain sentience and change as a result of seeing the outside world. She was envious of its inhabitants and desired to establish her own world of arts and crafts. In order to accomplish this, she transformed reality itself using the magical paintbrush, the same brush that was used to draw her, and drew a variety of doppelgangers and turned the heroes of Dreamland into balls so that they wouldn't obstruct her work. Drasha had no idea that Kirby would take the magical paintbrush from her after she had thrown it away, foiling her plans. But overall, Drasha was a very formidable opponent and almost succeeded. Throughout Kirby Canvas Curse, Drasha's appearance remains obscured in color and shadows until you reach the end of the game, where you confront her head-on. It certainly creates a great deal of suspense and mystery behind her character. 
In the final level, Drasha's World, the surroundings and map become gloomy, distorted, abstract, yet also very empty at the same time. Nothing stands across your way but her haunting laughs that follow in pursuit. Even when you face Drasha head-on and she loses the battle, she laughs maniacally, almost as if she's enjoying it. Shinya Kumazaki is a Japanese video game director, game designer, HAL Laboratory employee, and painter who is the current director of the Kirby series and voice actor of King Dedede. One of his art pieces happened to be of Drasha, and you can really see how dark and twisted Drasha and her world really are compared to the other villains in the series. Speaking of other villains, Drasha's attire strikes a chord with the Dark Matter Swordsman from Kirby's Dream Land 2, not only due to the negative energy Drasha acquired from observing the outside world, but perhaps as an inspiration being jealous of everyone's happiness. What's even more creepy, in the fight against Drasha's soul, she is looking straight at you, the player, as many have described it. The fight against Drasha's soul serves as an influence to many or if not all the soul bosses coming after her, which brings us to my next point. We were recently introduced to Drasha's sisters, Paintra and Vividria, giving us more insight to Drasha herself and her creator, as Paintra questions if her existence was a failure, a regret by the artist, wanting revenge on society for forgetting about her. Vividria, on the other hand, would go on to redeem herself to do better than her sisters, and find a good art school, which she'll indefinitely pursue being a master artist. Drasha herself was originally planned to come back as a playable dream friend in Kirby Star Allies, but the idea was scrapped. A return and or a redemption for Drasha would have honestly been quite pleasant to see, perhaps wanting to reunite with her sisters, teach them her art skills, and create a new world of art without having to resort to violence. Regardless, if she was ever playable, I could definitely see her using the artist, ESP, beam, high jump, magic, circus, and or balloon abilities. Drasha is also the only spin-off character to be featured as a wearable mask in Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe. The world of Drasha is hands down one of the most creepiest tracks in the series, perhaps in video game history. Next to Lavender Town, it sounds like static from a radio with hints of Drasha's theme. Drasha's theme is beautiful, elegant, but also spooky. It sounds like a mixture of Beethoven and the Haunted Mansion from Disney. As for Drasha's soul theme, it is very erratic, intense, complex, but also unique. It definitely gives you end of the world vibes. Drasha is a really interesting character that makes you want to see more of, given she had such a massive impact on the series. But what do you guys think about Drasha? Should she and other spin-off characters make a return? Just because Squeak Squad is awful doesn't mean you guys can keep making fun of it. Leave your little brother alone. Uh, objectively, yes, Kirby Squeak Squad is just bad. Abilities feel sluggish with oversimplified movesets barely making up for themselves with sparse ability scrolls. Underexplored mix mechanics haphazardly stumble about in what is less of a mechanic and more of an easter egg-esque appeal to the systems of 64. Bosses die if you simply look at them funny, not to say that they would be much of a challenge given any more health irregardless. Beyond gameplay, it is regarded with even more scorn for its portrayal, or rather betrayal, of Curb's character, permanently scarring his reputation with the Kirby kills God for cake mischaracterization. Kirby Squeak Squad is by no stretch of the term a poor quality game. But behind every rain cloud, there is a silver lining. Among the haystack, a brilliant needle is waiting to glint in your eyes. For every rat in Koenig, there is a rat king, or as it may be, a rat gentle thief. Despite the ceaseless bombardment of ill-mannered assaults upon Squeak Squad's contents, a certain hatted vandal has stolen not only the show, but also the hearts of those fortunate enough to bear witness. Deroach, mine beloved, though not exclusively mine, embodies the true value of Squeak Squad. Despite innumerable flaws, despite unforgivable misportrayal, despite everything, the sheer aura of Deroach, his admirable charm, is not one bit tarnished. Years after the DS era, years after the death of Flagship, the legacy and cultish following about DeRoach never falters. 
Amidst unfortunate circumstance and lackluster execution, he was not held back. You see, it's not about performance, it's about presentation. You put up a proper show, flash your brilliant smile, and you will not soon be forgotten. You can dress a vermin in a suit and hat, and it won't be the fleas or the devils of details that we remember, but the dazzling show you made of it all. Stumble as you might, but slip those trips into flips, and you just might stick the landing. Minus a tooth or two. Even at Kirby's worst, he's still the best. And that's found nowhere clearer than in the dapper vagrant that is DeRoach. We love you. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Bardometer, and today I have the pleasure of talking about, undoubtedly, one of the most interesting characters in the Kirby franchise. But in order to properly express my history with the warrior who crosses time, I need to tell a story. Kirby's Return to Dreamland was one of the first games I ever owned as a kid. It was by far my favorite game on the Wii, and led me to becoming the huge fan of Kirby that I am now. It did take me a while to beat it, since I wasn't very good at video games, but I vividly remember how impactful every stage felt because of how long it took me to get there. In particular, I love the boss fights. On YouTube, I'd spend hours just watching boss rushes of different games. But something always intrigued me about the Return to Dreamland videos. You see, I never beat Extra Mode, and therefore never got the true arena. But in these videos, there was clearly one boss who was not like the others. This weird copy of Meta Knight donned in white and fighting with awesome power. Who was this strange knight, and why was he so elusive? I had to know more. Flash forward, and finally I own a 3DS, albeit much later than everyone else. By the time I owned one, Planet Robobot was the newest Kirby game, and you can bet I played it right away. There, finally, did I meet Galactonite face to face, and his introduction definitely left an impression. Part of the reason I love this guy so much is because of how his mysterious nature is incorporated into the games he appears in. With each appearance, we're told more about him, but only left with more questions than answers. Why was he sealed away? Who sealed him away? Why is he so aggressive? Why is he called the Aeon Hero? And yet, we still know nothing, which only gets stranger when you realize Galactonite hasn't even appeared in canon. He is literally a mystery to even the games themselves. How amazingly meta! Kirby may never officially meet him, but somewhere out there, the greatest warrior in the galaxy is just lurking. A looming threat that will maybe never strike. But only maybe. An eternal hero, crossing the origin forever. Farewell, Galactonite. Let us meet again in another time, another place, or another dimension. When it comes to the player twos that Kirby's had over the years, Prince Fluff is a stitch above the rest, with quite an intricately woven history. The main character to his own game, known as Fluff's Epic Yarn, when the game was being conceptualized, a downgrade to Ally may seem harsh, but he still got his fans, myself included. After all, Kirby's Epic Yarn was the second Kirby game I ever played after Superstar Ultra, and to say it's different gameplay after peak like that was quite a whiplash would only be the start of this long thread. Epic Yarn was developed by Goodfeel, and I've actually sampled a fair bit of their work before and after with Wario Land Shake It and Yoshi's Woolly World. Epic Yarn, on the other hand, has such a distinct vibe to it that I feel only Kirby can bring to the table. The children's book narrative aesthetic for cutscenes gives the game a cozy feeling by both showing the fun between the two protagonists and the troubles in Dreamland brought about by that dastardly yin yarn. Level and world themes are so imaginative and creative, with Dino Jungle, Mushroom Run, and Tube Town being my personal highlights. The soundtrack is absolutely perfect in keeping that cozy vibe, but still using Kirby's own catalog of tunes once the pair of heroes gets back to Kirby's homeworld. Yarn transformations actually fall pretty in line with standard Kirby Fair copy abilities, even before they added the Rappel abilities in the Tiles 3DS re-release. In all honesty, they feel like a precursor to Mouthful modes if I think about it. Overall, it's a nice and relaxing platformer that anyone can pick up and play, which is pretty much the whole point of Kirby as a series, really. Prince Fluff himself, as a dual protagonist to Kirby, is quite the helpful fellow, and his and Kirby's antics after every retreat piece of magic yarn are always a cute treat. Fluff showing Kirby how to forge for food, as well as him and Kirby eating a giant cake together, you can see their bond grown stronger as Patchline is progressively stitched back together. And when Fluff gives Kirby his prized magic sock at the end of their journey together, it always pushes my buttons whenever I see it. 
It's a shame that the two friends of Kirby I met before and after Epic Yarn still pop up now and again, while Fluff has been relegated to sparse cameos, even though he was considered as a dream friend during Star Allies development. Hopefully the plucky prince can return one day, and Hal Goodfield can flesh out Plachtland and his character more. Kirby still has that old sock lying around somewhere, so who knows? A future adventure in Patchland might not just be a pincushioned dream. Regardless, I hope my ramblings on one of Kirby's spin-offs, more well-known characters, and the game he originated from was able to string some holiday cheer into the folks watching. See ya! I'm Micro Trash Aguilar, and when I first heard about this, I wanted to pick a random silly character like Glunk or Broom Hatter. But it felt lazy, so I'm going to talk about a character from Kirby's Return to Dreamland. That character is known, if at all, as Shearbell. Shearbell is a small pink flower like enemy, only a tiny bit bigger than Kirby, and it can only be found within the files of Kirby's Return to Dreamland. It has nothing but a model and some goofy animation. No code whatsoever. Halleck never said anything about it. There's a lot of theories as to how Hillbell would have been behaved in game, but they all essentially boil down to lunching at Kirby and eating him when he's nearby. The good thing is we don't merely have to speculate about what Hillbell would have done. Just as Hillbell was found with modding tools, Hillbell can be recreated in game with mods. Although there's no surviving code, that does not stop some people from making their own versions of Hearbell. And by some, I mean one. But with advancements in Kirby's Return to Dreamland modding, I know we'll get to see more soon. One of the things I love about Hearbell is its smile. It always seems so happy, despite it being nowhere to be seen in game, and despite being forgotten by its creators, it still always has a smile on its face and never fails to bring one to mind. Much like how every time you play Kirby's Return to Dreamland you notice something new, it feels the same way going into its files. I love everything else about Kirby's Return to Dreamland as well, but I'm sure somebody else will have talked about those things already. Although there isn't much for the enemy online outside of brief acknowledgement on wikis and those terrible videos about unused content, I found a 12 year old video showcasing Hearbell's model and animations. I also found a 5 year old comment from me that said, I wonder if I can use it in my KOTDO Mari levels. I had no idea what I was getting into. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Glitch. You may recognize me from the channel Game and Lore, an up and coming YouTube series that'll cover different games and character lore and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not really here to promote my own channel, I'm here to talk about Magalore. I've talked about Magalore's game chronology before on my channel, and I'm currently hard at work recording his literary history as well, but I don't think I've ever talked about my personal history with Magalore as a character. Although he's not the most influential character in the series to me, with that honor going to the Great King Dedede as my number one favorite video game character of all time, I feel like Magalore appeals to me because he's just the most cleverly thought out and thoroughly written character introduced in the Kumazaki era of the franchise. My first introduction to Kirby as a series was through Super Smash Bros. Brawl and Superstar Ultra, but my first proper introduction to Magalore as a character was through the 20th Anniversary Dream Collection that came out on the Wii, a game that Magalore was featured in. I was rather perplexed by the notion of him having some history with Kirby prior to this, and considering he wasn't featured in any of the six games that were included in the collection, I simply needed to know more about him. My exposure to Magalore in his Return to Dreamland debut came through Koopa Kung Fu's playthrough on YouTube, and that really sealed the deal for me because I loved watching friends play video games together as a kid, and it seemed like an enjoyable experience. Magalore's presentation really helped this too, as he was a close ally that turned to a betrayer, which I hadn't really seen in a game before then. I would eventually get my hands on Return to Dreamland properly when my cousin of mine gifted me a copy of Mario Galaxy 2 a couple of years later, only for it to have Return to Dreamland inside of a case instead. I was pretty ecstatic, and I would play through Return to Dreamland often to punch Magalore's face in on numerous winter vacation-based occasions. 
It practically became a holiday tradition of cracking that egg. Of course, with time, I became more of an analyst, and I've come to really appreciate Magler's character on a more technical level than just as a cool boss with cool music. Return to Dreamland itself is kind of like Magler in a way. It's just so fundamental to everything the series has made after its debut, from character design philosophies to game design structure, it's really hard to deny that it's not a prime portion of the series as a whole. In short, I really enjoy Magalore. He's a very unique character in the franchise, and I could keep talking about him. I've done so before, I'm gonna continue to do so on my channel, but for now, I've gotta say goodbye, because I don't want to take up any more time than I already have. Uh, thanks for having me, Safi, and I hope everybody has a happy holidays the rest of the year. Hello, I'm Muffin Snakes, and I really like Taranza. He is a wonderful and adorable magic spider who's deserving of so much love and hugs. When I saw him for the first time playing Kirby Triple Deluxe, I was like, Yo, is that a spider character? Then after beating the game and looking more into the lore, I just... Oh! Oh no! The poor spider! He and Sectoni used to be friends, but he had to assist Kirby and DDD in putting her to her eternal beauty sleep. Then in Star Allies, we learn that he's still mourning for her, not accepting the fact that she will never return. His guest Star Allies description indicates that he's still willing to do anything to see her again, one last time, even if he knows deep down that it'll never come to fruition. I played Triple Deluxe when I was in college, and around that time I had to start thinking about what to make my thesis film about. In the end, I created The Burnt Photo, an animated film that surrounds the theme of death and memento mori. That's on my YouTube channel, if anyone is interested. I also have to write up an artist statement for it with a specific page count. I'm pretty sure I wrote up at least two pages about Taranza and Sectonio. In short, Taranza's story helped inspire me to make that film. For a few years now, I've also been imagining an ambitious animatic sequence about the ending of Triple Deluxe and adding in Soul of Sectonia. Generally, I want to give Taranza more of a bigger role and explore his relationship with Sectonia, or Geronia as she used to be called. The characterizations will mainly be my interpretation based on what's given to us in canon. Uh, the ending will slightly be different, but I hope to give him a more proper farewell to his queen. Another thing I love about Taranza is that he was intentionally designed to appear androgynous in both his looks and voice according to Kumizaki's Miiverse post. I relate to that so much. I generally prefer to be perceived as androgynous in the way I dress and present myself. His design is so cool, I had to cosplay him. And he's wearing a cape, so that's even better. In 2020, I made the cosplay for Halloween. Even if I only stayed in my house wearing it all day, I sewed the cape using green velvet, burgundy crepe satin lining, and two different whips of fancy looking trim. I bought the vest online and replaced the buttons with silver metal ones. Though I would like to sell my own vest with a much more Taranza looking design. I bought the wig and styled it myself. The horns were sculpted from air dry clay and hand painted. Oh, and the eyes? I bought Kabachans and painted them. Overall, I really like what I've made so far. I'll continue to update it. So yeah, I really like Taranza a normal amount. There's so much more I want to say about him, but I'm on a time limit. Play Triple Deluxe if you haven't. Okay, bye. Hello everyone, this is Ivory, and I'm going to be talking about the Robobot armor from my favorite game of all time, Kirby Planet Robobot. Kirby once stumbled upon the armor as a mini-boss in the Haltman Works Company's possession, but once Kirby hops in it, it's going to be your best friend for this adventure. It can unscrew things, fight, carry heavy objects, wear stickers, open large doors, and it can take a break in charging stations, taking all of its memories with it. But most importantly, it can copy abilities like Kirby can. It's a helpful robot for sure. Once it and Kirby defeat the likes of the Haltman Works Company and unscrew Star Dream for good, it's turns out to be sentient? That's right, in contrast to the heart-erasing nature of Star Dream, it grows a heart and a bond throughout its time with Kirby and nudges Kirby back to the safety and atmosphere of his home planet. Not without shedding some coolant tears and goodbye, of course. The small moment honestly made the adventure and the moments leading up to it that much more impactful for me. Because now it's not just your friend, it's Kirby's friend too. Well, that's enough gushing about a suit of armor for me today. I hope doing so managed to bring some more life into this event and like Kirby did for the Robobot armor. Happy Holidays! Hey 
Hey everyone, I go by Parasyke. You might recognize me from my contributions to TNH's boss raid, or maybe my Metal Sonic voiceovers, or you might not know who I am at all. Which is fine. No, really, it's fine. Anyway, let me tell you a bit about Susanna Haltman, better known as Susie. First met in Kirby Planet Robobot, though secretary in title, Susie is better described as the second in command of the Haltman Works Company. Second only to the president and CEO himself, as well as her father, Max Prophet Haltman. Before this, however, when she was a young child, Susie was involved in a freak accident with the establishment's mother computer Stardream and sucked into another dimension. Though lost and alone in the cold reaches of the world between worlds for years, Susie did not give in to despair, but faced her fears and escaped against all odds. And yet, when she returned home, President Haltman would recognize her not as his beloved daughter, but tragically only as an employee, having lost his memories over that same time frame through his repeated efforts to use Stardream to bring her back. Unspeakable blood, sweat, and tears on both sides, only to be let down and forgotten. Have you ever poured your heart and soul into something, stepped outside your comfort zone, even just tried to survive? For all of it, not even to blow up in your face, but to be discredited and ignored? There's not a bigger satisfaction cancel on this earth than that. And Susie wasn't content to meet halfway. Seeking to teach the old man a lesson and prove she's literally the girl in the pick, she would accept her new possession and continue to work hard, prosper, and fight, and even scheme to lift the veil off his eyes and be seen for her accomplishments. And, <coughs> although it didn't go so well, you gotta respect it. Not all of us are fortunate enough to have an immediate circle of friends and family who understand and connect with your interests and ideals. I can say from experience, it's hard. Dedication doesn't even begin to describe the investment into Susie's journey, her mission, and that deserves recognition. We all deserve to be seen for what we are and what we do, don't we? Sometimes I see myself in her position. I may not have a huge resume of finished projects at the ready just yet, but I've been working so hard in the shadows for so long and on so many things. I've got a lot to share with the community, and I'm not content to just be a nobody anymore. I want to be seen for it, for making my dreams come true. And if Susie can find her calling in an array of dream friends, who's to say I can't? Who's to say you can't? Always hold on to your hopes and dreams, and always be willing to work hard for them. Well, that's not to say some time off isn't nice every once in a while. <laughs> you might not know who I am as a creator now, but you will. I'll make sure of it. But for now, my best wishes go to those in need who will receive this collective charity, and thank you to Savi for letting me speak. Who's next to be seen and heard? They say in space, no one can hear you scream. But what if, by some divine miracle, someone heard you? Someone saved you? How would you repay that person? Highness was a magic ancient who traveled the galaxy. On his journeys, he would come across three girls and save them from disaster. Francisca, who was freezing to death in a snowstorm. Flambeau, who was caught in a raging inferno. And lastly, Zan Partizan, who climbed a tower with nothing to lose, only to get struck by lightning. Highness saved the girls, unlocking their elemental powers. These would become the Mage Sisters, and they would go on to devote their lives to Highness. And for a while, they were at peace, until Highness got banned from the Discord server and decided the reasonable course of action was to awaken a destruction god. Unfortunately, the ritual went wrong and the mage sisters had to pick up the lost pieces of the Jamba heart, crashing their fortress into Popstar in the process. Kirby beats up Francisca and Flamberge gets pissed because historians will say Francisca and Flamberge are really good friends. Oh, actually, this would be a good time to bring up that they're not sisters in a sibling way, but more like in a religious way, with like like how nuns are called sisters. When fighting Xan, the eldest of the mage sisters, she decides the best course of action is to self-destruct the fortress with Kirby inside, showing the lengths the sisters will go in order to destroy anybody who dares stop their ritual. After another round of battles with the sisters, you come across Highness, who's trying to wrap up the ritual. Before you can do anything, Zan stops you in your tracks. Battle ensues, you win. But this is one thing's really interesting. 
Xan calls out for help from Highness. However, he doesn't see this as a plea from his friend. No, this is an interruption. Not even remembering the name of the girl who devoted her life to him, Highness smacks away an already defeated Xan. When Kirby beats the piss out of Highness, he saps the energy from the Mage Sisters and uses their frozen bodies as weapons. He hurls them at you, uses them as bats, as a shield, and he even forms a friend circle with them. But this isn't what friendship is. This isn't a team. This is a cult. On his last legs, Hina sacrifices himself and the Mage Sisters to the Jamba Heart, summoning Void Termina. Fast forward to Void's defeat and the Sisters and Highness get lost in another dimension, where they stew in Void Termina's hatred and dark energy. We see how little Highness thinks of the Mage Sisters, as he uses wooden logs to attack you in their place. They're so disposable to him that they might as well be objects. But, despite everything, the Mage Sisters are still devoted to Highness. They fight you with everything they got, and it's a really hard fight. In the end, Kirby purifies them all with a friend heart. Ines acts like he had just woken up from a madness-induced coma, while Francisco and Flamberge talk to him. Zan, on the other hand, is left pondering. All this Void Terminal stuff is over. Ines is back to his old self. After being filled with hatred for so long, how can they just go back? In the gallery, we see the sisters and Highness relaxing on the beach. The song that plays is titled, let them know we're happy. Sure, if you have some sort of trauma or PTSD, your problems won't magically go away with the giant friend heart. But maybe you need a friend to help you out. If you hold on to hope, maybe you'll find peace. Even if it feels like you're screaming out into space, against impossible odds, in another dimension, someone might hear you. Someone might save you. But also, if you believe you're in a cult or an abusive relationship, Get out of there. It's not always easy to catch onto the signs, but stay safe, okay? That's all from me. Hello everyone, Lost Garf here from the Kirby's Dreamcast podcast. It's been going on forever. My favorite character is Morpho Knight. I love Morpho Knight. They've only been in two games, but I love them anyway. She had such an amazing entrance. Let's talk about Star Allies. You go through all these levels as one of the friends, and then you see Galacta Knight. And it's like, oh snap, Galacta Knight, that's crazy. We're going to fight Galacta Knight. Cool, cool, cool. It's going to be really awesome. And then a butterfly comes out of nowhere and lands on their lance. And then you see a heart, and then they absorb Galacta Knight. It's like, what? Okay, all right, that's weird. And then Morpho Knight appears, and she has this really cool rise up animation. So freaking cool. Blown away from the start. The fight's really fun. It's a fun challenge. And then you beat her, and then. All the talk about her because it's gonna be a while before she shows up again and it's just wait a sec we all know the butterfly the butterfly's been there since day one the butterfly's been there since kirby's dreamland the butterfly is the second character to show up in kirby's dreamland because she's in the opener with kirby and a couple other butterflies she's in a bunch of openers with kirby over the game years that is insane and that is so fun it's crazy to think a character so old is morpho knight and then we get Forgotten Land. And you're going through, of course, the post-game, and it's still canon. And then we're fighting Factor 4 go again. And then they get absorbed by the Butterfly. What a surprise that was. Morpho Knight's back. She's here again. And she's canon. <laughs> she's canon. Oh my god. She's canon before Galacta Knight. That's crazy. Kirby met her first. That is wild. And then the fight is intense. It is fun. It is crazy. Love it a lot. It is... Such a good song! Metal as F, oh my god! And then the power is OP as crap when you get it. You can easily clear the arena any difficulty with that weapon. It is ridiculous how strong her sword is. There's also a light novel with them in it, which is pretty cool. And I just want to see what else comes out of this. I really do. Morphonite is exciting, something new and fresh, and I can't wait to see what comes out in the future with them. When it comes to Kirby characters, I think that Void Termina has got to be like one of the most interesting characters of all time. I remember when I first got Kirby Star Allies and I was like really excited to play it. I was like, huh, this game is surprisingly short and simple. Then I got to the final boss 
And I was like, holy crap, this thing has- this thing is like dark matter. I was very obsessed with like dark matter as a kid. I was always drawn to like the darker aspects of Kirby. Like Drasha, Soul, Dark Matter, Zero, Zero Two. When I when I played Kirby Star Allies and saw Boy Termina, I was blown away. And I have a huge appreciation for Void Terminus themes. I've like remixed it like multiple times. It's gotta be at least like five times now. And Sparkling Star, like Astral Birth Void, I had to have remixed that like at least a couple times on my channel. As of now, I have an unreleased remix of the entire suite that I am going to release at some point. Even now, I can like explain the lore of Void Termina with like, like Highness, the Jim Bastion Cult, the Ancients, all of that. I I can like explain it to my friends, and they're like, "Huh? Like, what are you talking about?" I, I'm so passionate about it. It's like Void Termina was like the solidification of me being brought into the Kirby fandom because I was like, this lore is really interesting and I want to make more for this community and I want to make more for, I want to make more art and stuff and I enjoy making art for the Kirby community and music and remixes and all that. It's just so cool that this one boss has done so much to cement me into the community. Okay, picture this. You wake up, you brush your teeth, you wash your face, you take a relaxing shower, put on your best outfit, drive down to the movie theater, purchase a ticket, grab the biggest bucket of overpriced popcorn you can, sit in front of that titanic silver screen, and now, now, it's time for our feature presentation, a jumbo-sized picture of Elphalyn. Hey, wait, this isn't the right script. Hey, hey, hold on, this is my to-do list. All right, let me start over. Elphalyn is the blue mystical chinchilla who debuts in Kirby's very first 3D outing. Yeah, he's not some all-powerful deity or an invincible savior, but man, give the kids some credit, why don't you? Adventuring alongside Kirby and Bandanity on the front lines, standing side by side with them to the end, and just enjoying their company. Man, if you and the homies take naps together, then by law, you are inseparable. And even after being kidnapped, even after witnessing Fecto Elphilus use Popstar as a softball, even after teaming up with Kirby and Bandanity for one last vehicular manslaughter, this blue kid still does something huge, something even Kirby couldn't do. Close the connection between worlds and put an end to planetary collision. He put his life on the line for both the world that had it out for him and the world he knew practically nothing about. What hatred do you find in that? That's love. That's all love. I love this kid. That's his determination. Even though he hasn't been dealt the best hand in life, he still puts others before himself without hesitation. That's Elflin. And it's very simple, but man, it's powerful. This guy can just hop through dimensions like doors. Oh, that's so cool. I, ah, I, I gotta be like this. Humble, heroic, and blue. I gotta be blue. He has earned these ears. He has earned them. I've said it before, and I will say it again. These ears are cinematic. They were made for the big screen. Critics are calling it the number one movie in the world. Audiences are giving it a two thumbs up, so see Elflin now. It will be the first movie to make one elf a million dollars. <sighs> yeah, so Elflin's kind of a cool character. You know? I, I don't really have any thoughts on him. Yeah, yeah, you take that as you will. Um, excuse me, Theater Usher. Oh, one ticket for the two o'clock showing of Elflin, please. <laughs> what do you mean it's sold out? <laughs> oh boy, that sure was a lot of Kirby, wasn't it? Well, I hope this video could bring a smile to y'all, and if you want to bring one to those in need, please consider donating. Even just a dollar would help. With that all out of the way, special thanks to everyone who partook in this project, even those who ended up rejecting my invitation. To Astro for the wonderful transitions, Rabbi for the cool art piece, and the entirety of my big Kirby family, Collab Star Allies. I think that's enough of me rambling though, so with that being said, Savvy, out.